That was a great introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, maybe a little more credit should go to Mike uh, in some of the comments you made. And you're not seeing my video uh, only because I don't want to be distracted looking at how I look on a video while I'm giving a talk. Um, so I am really here. And just a, an AV check, you're seeing the slides appropriately? Yes, all fine. Okay, let me get the laser pointer on. And we're ready to go. So I want to start with a concept and a question, which is what does the immune system need to do? And what I think of it, need, it needing to do is to deal with a series of uh, not completely predictable challenges that occur at not completely predictable times in not completely predictable places as shown in this cartoon. And so, how does the immune system set up to deal with these diverse and unpredictable entities at different times? And that what, where, and when is addressed using a combination of soluble effectors, and I'm not really going to talk about these today, mobile elements, meaning cells that can move into the relevant target site, and a series of organized tissues that facilitate rare cell, cell interactions that you need for effective adaptive immunity. And if you accept what I just said is the way the immune system works, then you have to uh, also accept that nearly all immune function occurs in complex lymphoid or parenchymal tissues. And if that's the case, you cannot understand how it works by just looking at isolated cells or molecules. And the only way that I know of to really look at what's happening in the tissue itself is to image and we'd like both dynamic and high content information. So that's the rationale for what we do. Uh, and I'll try to point out along the way where uh, I think the evidence is very uh, strong that you cannot get the information you need from uh, isolated cells, flow cytometry, single cell sequencing, or anything else. And so some of the key questions we've tried to answer over the years are, what are the cellular dynamics that are involved in normal and pathological responses and how does that relate to function? How does tissue microanatomy affect responses? And for example, why are lymph nodes uh, built the way they're built? What are the molecular signals that guide these processes of positioning, movement, and interaction? And then what happens when the immune system is interacting with uh, epithelial, parenchymal tumor cells at various body sites? And there are a number of challenges if you want to do imaging. You need adequate resolution. It can be spatial or temporal. You'd like to minimally disturb the physiology of what you're trying to look at. You'd like to look at many things at the same time. You'd like to look as long as you can look. And you have to process the data. And the more multiplex you make something, the longer you look, the larger the volume you examine the bigger the data sets get, the more complex they are and the harder they are to process. And then you need to translate that information into some useful display to show to other people. And there is no method I'm aware of that actually optimizes all of these criteria, and which is why we need different approaches to address different questions. So I'm going to start with the multi-photon dynamic methods and just summarize a few points. It's great to look at temporal aspects of biology, but it's typically limited to fewer than five parameters. It has to do with the number of detectors and the number of colors you can look at in real time. Signaling measurements are possible. Uh, I would say they're difficult beyond calcium, and NFAT is more or less a calcium signal. So I put it in the same category. There are other reporters and probes, but you'd be hard pressed to find lots of uh, highly quantitative papers that look at signaling under these conditions. And the observation range is seconds to a few hours for true cell tracking. And uh, although you can do some studies in explants with human material, more or less this is an, an animal approach. To remind everybody how it works though, this is Coles to Newcastle at, at UCI, given uh, Mike's pioneering work in this area with Ian Parker you expose the tissue of interest. And I want to then point out that except for ear skin in the animals, you always do surgery. 
surgery does cause inflammation. So if you read a paper and somebody says they're looking at non-perturbed tissue using 2P imaging, you should look carefully at what controls they ran to be sure they have not caused inflammation. The most sensitive measures are usually vascular leak, and that's easy to see because you can put probes into the blood circulation, or the arrival of neutrophils where they don't belong. You need then genetically labeled neutrophils, but they're easy to come by to do these experiments. So you should be careful about that. Assuming everything's done right, you scan in the XY dimension, focus up and down and collect the stack of imaging data, repeat that over time, and then play it back two to 300 times real speed and compressed in the Z dimension. And you see things like this, which is uh, naive T cells moving in the paracortical region of a lymph node. And the impression you get is that these green cells are moving in uh, empty space, however they'd like to move, but that's the environment they're actually in. And so you should never believe what an imager tells you based on what he or she does not see. The other way to say that, and people find this memorable, is always worry about what's in the black, <clears throat> things we don't make fluorescent and we don't see that are impacting the behavior of the cells that we're tracking. And it's really important to keep that in mind. And in planning experiments, one of the ways to deal with this, since we cannot make everything visible, is to put control in experimental cells that should behave differently in the same animal so they appear in your same imaging volume so they're dealing with the same unknowns in the black empty space. Looking at two different uh, animals at different times does not normalize for this unknown black space. And so I think of the immune system with three major layers, the barrier function of skin and mucous membranes. If it's breached, you get innate responses and then you go get adaptive responses over time. So let's look at innate responses. This is a sandfly with a successful blood meal. And if we look in the bitten skin of the mouse here, we can see a blood vessel outlined here in blue, the region of the bite outlined here in red, uh, GFP genetically labeled neutrophils here in green, Leishmania organisms here in red. And when we animate this, we get a lot of information. The neutrophils always come out of the correct side of the vessel, even though we're only looking at over about one cell diameter. So directional control is, is almost absolute in vivo. The cells move in a fairly linear manner very rapidly and then accumulate and begin to do what we call swarming in the middle of the damaged area. But this underestimates the complexity of the behavior because if we turn our imaging onto the side and we get a free channel for the collagen that's shown in blue here in the dermis, Remember, black is not empty space, that's the epidermis, but it's not fluorescent. We see the neutrophils moving into particular regions. And what they're doing is filling in where the sand fly bit and disturbed the barrier function. And so this is recreating the barrier function transiently to keep uh, pathogens from accessing the disturbed capillaries that were damaged during the blood meal where they could go systemic. And then gradually wound healing occurs and you rebuild the, um, the barrier function. And the point of all this is that a number of years ago, the main paradigm that was known was the rolling, firm binding, and transmigration of neutrophils, and much less was known about the complex behaviors of the type I just showed you in a tissue environment with extracellular uh, matrix components, damps and PAMPs, many different cell types, and so on. And so Tim Lammerman uh, at that time in the lab undertook to study this process of neutrophil behavior uh, in the tissue context. He set up a sterile injury model in which we use a brief laser pulse to kill a few cells. This enables us to, if we have blood tracers present, avoid clipping vessels and therefore to prevent um, the, the role of uh, platelets in this particular process, making the analysis simpler. Uh, we can control the precise timing of the damage and the size of the damage, and that will become important in a, in a moment. And when we do that, I didn't realize I still had the music on here, just to wake you up. What happens, and hopefully this will replay, is that we get the swarming behavior, the red neutrophils in this particular case, green or monocytes accumulate in the center here at the lesion. 
And it's only later that the monocytes uh, come and are attracted. And in fact, if you deplete neutrophils, the monocytes never find the lesion. So they're secondarily recruited by the neutrophil. And we worked out some of the underlying mechanistic function here. You can see the, the very straight uh, paths of the neutrophils from hundreds of microns away from the lesion uh, under normal circumstances. But if you deplete uh, and remove the LTD4 receptor, although the Son, Son, yeah. I hate to interrupt, but your volume has gone down quite a bit. Oh, sorry. At least for me. Is that true forever for others? Me too. All right. How about now? Better. It's not as good as it was at the start, though. All right. How about now? Is it no. Better? No. Not really. That's strange because it's completely maxed out now. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can put a headphone on and see if I improve it. I can hear you. What do other people think? Is it okay? I mean, it's fine. All right. The, the volume is quite low. You can barely hear the speaker. Uh, I just put on a microphone. It's about as good as I can do. I, I think that sounds better, at least for me. It does sound better. All yep. right. We'll do it this way. So what I was saying here is that in the wild type, we get the cells to come from quite a distance, hundreds of microns in a linear way. But if we eliminate the receptor for leukotriene before, this becomes uh, a very erose and slow process. And so Tim worked all this out uh, over time. I'm not going to go through all this uh, in detail. But one of the things that he noticed was that as the swarm occurs, where we're looking at the second harmonic channel for the dermal collagen, we wind up getting a hole where the neutrophils accumulate. And so that raised an interesting question. And this is something that Stefan Udehart, uh, who now has his own lab in Erlangen, has studied using a new preparation in which we're able to look at both embryologically derived fixed tissue macrophages monocyte-derived peritoneal macrophages and neutrophils in the same preparation in the peritoneal wall. And when we do that, we see that these uh, macrophages scan their environment, but they don't move. There are a small number of neutrophils that come into the field uh, as we're watching. If we put in bacteria, we get massive neutrophil recruitment without movement of these macrophages. And if we allow swarms to form from those incoming neutrophils and we create damage, all the neutrophils go to the damaged area. In all of our experiments in every tissue, once these neutrophils are in the tissue, what they're paying attention to is damage. And so what Stefan set up was an analogy uh, to the skin imaging where he now creates sterile damage in the peritoneal wall. And when he does that, we get exactly what we saw on the skin. The neutrophils come in and swarm. They digest the corpses of the damaged cells, and we get disruption of the tissue. And so that raised a question. Cells die in tissues all the time. We know that the neutrophils are responding to the death of cells. And if every time they came in and formed a swarm, we got damage to the tissue, then it would be very hard to imagine maintaining organ physiology over time. Well, that model has to do with, is a cell dying or are we creating a lesion the way we did with the laser of many cells? And so what Stefan did is scale things down. So we now kill a single fibroblast here. And if you do that while you're watching those macrophages, within a few minutes, they immediately sense the death. And then over 10 or 15 minutes, they extend processes and cover or what we call cloak the corpse. And that has a dramatic effect on neutrophil behavior. So this is the movie I showed you before of what happens when we have a multicellular damaged area. 
with this recruitment and very linear uh, behavior and swarming. But if we have only a single cell damage, although neutrophils do enter the tissue eventually, they don't show that directed migration. They don't form a swarm. They don't disrupt the tissue. And the reason for that is that the lead neutrophil doesn't have access to the dead cell. And what Tim's work had shown is that the death of the lead neutrophil is essential for starting that LTB4 leukotriene cascade that you need for swarming. And so that's just what's illustrated here. Now you could question this model because it's all laser induced. And so what uh, Stefan did is perfusion fix the animal and uh, there's no manipulation. He just scanned the peritoneal wall microscopically and we see in the steady state these cloaking patterns. So we know that this is a process that's occurring under steady state conditions. If we look in a tissue that's undergoing continuous stress, such as the diaphragm, and we deplete these macrophages using CD169 DTR uh, animals with DT treatment, what we wind up with are necrotic myofibers in the diaphragm associated with very intense neutrophil infiltration when we don't have this protective effect of the macrophages. And so putting all this together, and it's published, so I haven't gone through all the data, these resident macrophages prevent innate immune damage in response to intermittent cell death. This prevent, allows local healing by direct cell replacement, and there's no need for post-inflammation resolution. And indeed, monocyte-derived macrophages are not recruited to, and they do not enter into this process at all. We have some evidence that there's an age-dependent transition from an anti to a pro-inflammatory behavior of these resident macrophages, and that could be part of what we call inflammaging. And uh, amyloid-induced transition of a similar nature may contribute to microglial-induced pathology in Alzheimer's. These are areas that we're continuing to study. So let me move from that innate response to adaptive responses. Uh, this is a diagram that I've shown for many years from uh, Uli Van Andrian and Charles Mackay. And I want to focus in on moving from what's happening in the lymph node environment to effector cells. And almost all lymphocytes think of effector cells as dots on flow plots. And they're in the upper left quadrant or lower right quadrant, and they make gamma, or they make uh, IL-17, or they make uh, IL-4. But these analyses don't answer these questions. Do effector cells make their cytokine continuously, briefly, or episodically in a peripheral tissue site? How does the dynamic relate to function? Is cytokine deliver local when the cells are stopped or broad due to their motility? And what happens to those T cells after their initial response to antigen in tissues? And so this comes up in particular in the context of so-called T cell exhaustion in chronic infections or in tumors, where the claim is that very high PD1 expression is associated with dysfunction of those particular T cells. And so this is work that we published a while ago, but I think the lessons are appropriate in the current um, environment where people are focused in on what PD1 actually does. This is work of Jackson Egan and Tetsuya Honda. We set up a delayed type hypersensitivity model. We transfer small numbers of EGFP-labeled OT2s. We prime with a combination of KLH as an irrelevant antigen plus ovalbumin. We draw all the relevant effector cells into the ear by creating inflammation just with the KLH. And then we get a very precise timing of when the cells see their antigen by putting peptide in IV. And so that is absolutely critical uh, in, we now know when the cells entered and we can answer some of the questions that I uh, mentioned in the previous slide about how cells behave when they see their ligand in the tissue. And so this is a 14 hour imaging run. The cells are moving around. We add ovalbumin and they stop. And then over several hours, more cells come into the field, but many of the cells that were stopped begin to move. And then eventually, if we add a second bolus of, uh, of albumin, most but not all the cells stop again. And if we now track that over time, we see that with, within a few minutes of adding the specific antigen, the cells go into 
migratory arrest. They're sort of wiggling and, and wandering around the local presenting cell at one to two microns per minute. And then over six to eight hours, they recover their motility. And that's anti-correlated with cytokine function. They come in not making their cytokine. This is true for TNF, interferon gamma, or IL-2. Cytokine peaks within an hour or two after they've undergone the stopping reaction. And as they regain motility, they lose their cytokine production. So we've answered that first set of questions. They don't distribute their cytokine broadly. They make it primarily when they're stopped. They only make it in a monotonic way. And that itself is surprising because we would think that the peptide MHC ligands are still present at this few hours after uh, administration. And so that raised the question, is there some kind of trogocytosis or other way of losing antigen presentation or were the T cells changing their capacity to actually sense the antigen? To look at that, we did everything I already showed you. We transfer the naive cells, we prime the animals, we draw the cells into the ear with KLH, we stop them and, and induce the first cycle of cytokine production with uh, ovalbumin peptide. And now we take in vitro activated OT2 cells in a different color and transfer them together with the third party activated cells that I told you we always need to evaluate what's happening in a particular preparation and in that black environment, and we look at what happens. So the control cells do what we hope they would do. They move at about six microns per minute, so the prep is in good shape. The ones that had been stopped before are largely, but not completely, at this time point back to full motility, but a large fraction of the new transferred OT2 cells are at this stopping uh, speed. They are recognizing antigen and they're stopping which means that these cells are ignoring antigen that's present in their environment. Why is that? Well, at that two hour peak of response, they've upregulated PD-1, not CTLA-4 or LAG-3. We haven't looked at TIGIT or TIM-3. They haven't lost their receptor expression. And if we block PDL one instead of returning the full motility by four hours in this experiment, many cells are still stopped even at six or seven hours, and they continue to make <clears throat> interferon gamma. And so this tells us that PD-1 has a negative feedback role in controlling the dynamics and functions of effector cells in inflamed site. It's not just something that comes up on cells that are undergoing, quote, exhaustion and tumor bearing or chronically infected or even tolerized animals. The other thing is that this is presumably because you're titrating effector function to antigen levels to balance host defense against immunopathology, but it means that these are first cohorts of effector cells are not completely clearing the infection. And to do that, you need some type of ratchet where you continue to introduce new cells like we did in our experiments, capable of looking at that lower level of antigen availability that happens as the first cohort of effectors are doing their job. So you get eventual clearance. And this would argue that you need stem-like memory cells or perhaps these TCF1-like cells that people talk about in tumors if you wanted to clear the tumor. <clears throat> so we and others, you know, over the years, have used this kind of imaging to do lots of work looking at dynamics in the lymph node, revealing the T cells move on a fibroblastic reticular pathways in searching for dendritic cells in the lymph node, looking at dynamics in germinal centers, <clears throat> observing dendritic cell sampling bacteria in the gut, looking at what happens in the kidney, studying uh, myeloid and lymphoid dynamics in granulomas in the liver and in the lungs, looking at this innate response in the ear, as well as this adaptive response in the ear that I've just spoken about, looking at osteoclast behavior in bone marrow, or looking at this behavior of uh, resident macrophages in cloaking responses uh, in vivo. The problem is that all these experiments are done in a very small imaging volume, and even in a mouse lymph node, we miss most of what's going on. And if I'm worried about what's in the black in my imaging volume, everything out here is in the black. So we started trying to section lymph nodes that we did 2P imaging on to see if we were looking at representative behaviors of cells and realized that at the time we were doing this, most uh, histochemistry was red, green, and looking for yellow, two parameters, three parameters, 
but everybody else was going down the hallway to do flow cytometry in 9, 12, 15 parameters because you needed multiple markers to identify each of the several cell populations you wanted to study in an experiment. And that's obviously true in the tumor microenvironment. It's true when you look at these complex flow panels that everybody's using now. And so we needed something that bridged the gap between these. And this is the multiplex static methods. There's no dynamics, but the parameter space can e easily exceed 40 to 50. I'll show you 82 parameters in a moment. We can probe signaling and post-translational modifications. If we have the right antibodies, we can look at nuclear localization of various transcription factors. We can study proteins and RNA by using uh, fish methods. And we obviously can use this with ethically collected human material. So the original method devised by Michael Gerner, uh, as Francesco said, is histocytometry. We stain in up to 14 colors. I'll show you an example of 12 uh, in a moment. We deconvolve to improve the resolution a bit. We do channel compensation the way you would do for spillover and flow. And then we use software tools to do segmentation and create cellular objects with all the associated fluorescence. But that's the equivalent of list mode flow data. So we can now take that information and put it directly into flow cytometry software and gate and get quantitative data on <clears throat> cell populations identified by multiple markers. But we keep all the XYZ spatial information so all the gated cells can be printed back in the original image so that we know their location. And I'll show you in a moment, it works with human samples. Uh, I'll give you an example where we use it for antiphosphoprotein and anticytokine staining. So this enables us to look at signaling state, function, phenotype, and spatial positioning all at one time. So to illustrate how it works, if we just look here in the middle, if we stain with B220 and we gate on these cells and call them B cells and make them blue, gate on these CD3 positive cells and call them red, Flojo gives us this perfect sagittal section of a mouse lymph node with peripheral B cell follicles in blue and the paracortical regions in red. We've done quantitative studies and for naive T and B cells, we get a complete match between histocytometry and flow cytometry. But the surprise came when we looked at dendritic cells. This little wedge you barely can see here are the number of dendritic cells we get using normal extraction procedures and infiltration on a nylon filter the way you normally would do this. This is the number we get when we do histocytometry. It's about a 20% overestimate because of the difficulty of segmenting um, dendritic shaped cells, but it doesn't account for this gross difference. And in all the studies we've done in for these types of cells, for macrophages and myeloid cells, for um, other stromal uh, components, there's always underrepresentation in any single cell method, whether it's CYTOF, single cell RNA-seq, regular flow cytometry, compared to the imaging. And so you have to disabuse yourself of the notion that single cell data, as powerful as those kinds of studies are, are really representing the ground truth of what happens in a tissue imaging uh, in this kind of static multiplex mode is much more accurate. Uh, Michael originally used that to look at the disposition of all the different dendritic cells that we knew about at the time in a lymph node and found surprisingly, but consistent with uh, limited earlier data from Bernard Mallison, that uh, CDC1s were primarily in the deeper T cell zone, whereas CDC2s we're in the more peripheral region and even in the subcapsular sinus space. And that helped us uh, improve our answer to this particular conundrum, which is we draw these diagrams of all these cells interacting productively, but they're only early in a response, maybe a few hundred antigen bearing dendritic cells in an entire mouse draining lymph node and one in 100,000 to a million antigen specific CD8 or CD4 cells or a comparable number of B cells. And for the T cells, we know that both an antigen-specific CD8 and an antigen-specific CD4 need to interact with the same dendritic cell in order to generate a helped CD8 response. And so uh, we built off of work that Mike Allen and Mark Miller originally did, looking at the scanning rates and estimating as a 90% likelihood that you would get an interaction during one passage of a naive cell through a lymph node if it's there for say 12 or 24 hours, but that would not compute to efficient interaction of two different antigen specific cells with the same dendritic cell. 
And so we needed to understand what else is going on to drive this reaction. And so when Antonio was in the lab and learning histocytometry, he came up with a, an unexpected observation. I've already told you that the CDC1s uh, are more in the central area here, and the CDC2s are in the more peripheral area. And remember, CDC2s are more specialized for MHA class two presentation. CDC1s can do both, but they're uniquely good at class one presentation. And it turns out that CD4 cells that look at MHC class two ligands are not evenly distributed in the T cell zone, but they're concentrated in the periphery near the CDC twos that present via class two, whereas the CD8s do not show that bias and they overlap more with the CDC ones. This is true in multiple mouse strains and it's true in human lymph nodes as well. So it's a generally uh, constant feature of lymph nodes. And this just shows the quantification. We then went to see how this is uh, supported. We thought it probably had to do with chemokines uh, or similar chemoattractant responses. And one of the striking differences between CD4s and CD8s was the expression of GPR138, or better known as EBI2. It's much better expressed in CD4 cells. CD4 cells and not CD8 respond to the oxysterol ligand in a transwell assay. And if we use knockouts for EBI2, we lose the bias positioning of the CD4 T cells. And the same thing is true if we uh, knock out their oxysterol ligand. This has an, an important effect on the response. If we look uh, at early time points, we can tell whether T cells are interacting with their dendritic cells by their formation of clusters. And what we see is the red wild type cells by nine hours have formed very nice clusters in the periphery where the CDC2s are localized, but the blue EBI2 deficient cells, which are starting further away from those relevant dendritic cells, have not been able to effectively interact and begin to drive a CD4 uh, response. And that has dramatic influence in cases where you need CD4 help for CD8 cells. This is a vaccine model <clears throat> for uh, malaria. Liver stage protection, you use systemic priming with an adeno-OVA, similar to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine out of Oxford. So it comes from the same lab. You then come in with a nanoparticle OVA IV, and that gives you resident memory CD8 cells in the liver that give you near 100% protection against sporous OI challenge. Depletion of CD4s before priming eliminates all protection. Depletion of CD4 cells at the time of challenge has no effect because it's all mediated by the helped CD8 cells. And when you use EBI2 deficient systems, you lose about 80% of the protection. This is in a whole animal depletion, and you could argue EBI2 does many things. So we've done this where only the CD4 cells are EBI2 deficient, and we get, again, the same complete, almost complete loss of CD8-dependent protection because these cells are no longer getting timely help. And so these data told us that both DCs and T cells are non-randomly distributed in the paracortex. The CDC2s and CD4s match each other, bringing the responding cells into close proximity. It's mediated by EBI2. And if you disrupt this, you lose uh, vaccine protection or in data, I'm not showing you resistance to, to helmets, saying that this kind of micro anatomic organization is absolutely critical to the functioning of the adaptive immune system. And so we built this into an overall model together with other data that you have, rather than distributing all your uh, adaptive uh, lymphocytes out into all the tissues where they interact with tissue dendritic cells, you bring these two reactants together in a localized space, a lymph node, Within the lymph node, you concentrate both of those reactants within the T cell zone. In the T cell zone, the T cells are moving on this FRC network, as I told you previously, and that's the same network on which the dendritic cells reside. So you've reduced the volume for interaction even further, improving the efficiency of reaction. We showed that once any T cell finds a good dendritic cell under these conditions, the combination makes CCL3 and 4. And that now gives chemokine guidance to other T cells. And that, uh, if we eliminate this 
uh, chemokine gradient, we again lose all CD4 help for CD8 T cells. Even though the CD8 T cells do find a dendritic cell and become activated, they can't find the same dendritic cell as the CD4 cells and they don't get help. And now I've shown you that in the steady state, the distribution of dendritic cells and T cells is matched in order to, again, optimize the interaction. So instead of a sort of pinball machine, which some people said is, is the way things work in the lymph node, there's a very hierarchically organized set of physical and chemical cues that enable these rare cell interactions to occur very efficiently in what is otherwise an incredibly inefficient system, very small numbers of cells in a very large volume where they need to interact at the earliest possible time. So we've used this approach in order to study uh, tumor immunity in some human systems. And this is work Weiming Yu has done with Rafid Hassan's group. Rafid has studied an immunotoxin, uh, a combination of an antibody to mesothelin together with Pseudomonas exotoxin to treat mesothelioma. It didn't work especially well, although it does kill some of the tumor cells. So they then added in anti-PD-1 to see if that would improve things. And when we looked at these core biopsies using this type of histocytometry uh, in 12 colors, we found in the immunotoxin-treated cores an occasional image uh, of this type where you see this very intense staining with PDL1. And since PDL1 is typically upregulated by gamma interferon, we looked at where HLA-DR is expressed because we imagine that would be co-regulated. Uh, by gamma, and indeed the brightest expression of DR is precisely overlapping with the PDL1. But that gamma is not coming from CD8 effectors. These are all clustered CD4 T cells, although we are still trying to work out the gamma stain to really check that those individual cells are the ones that are making the gamma. And those T cells are PD1 positives, consistent with them seeing their antigen in this environment. If the uh, patients are treated with anti-PD-1, now we see many, many more of exactly the same types of clusters. PDL1 one positive myeloid cells, DR bright, associated with clustered CD4 T cells. Now, we have a long way to go to relate this to efficacy of treatment or anything else, but the spatial localization of the response of CD4 cells is important if you try to interpret data that came from Rob, Bob Schreiber's lab. So let me give you a model and relate it to his observations. The immunotoxin kills the mesothelioma cells, releases tumor antigens that gets picked up, you get presentation, but as the response begins to initiate, you upregulate PDL1 in the absence of an anti PD1 or PDL1 blocking agent, the system largely comes to equilibrium and doesn't proceed. You add the anti-PD-1, that empowers the system, and now you get a much higher burst of gamma. Gamma in the classical Schreiber mode upregulates class one on the tumor cells. They may also upregulate PDL1, but in the presence of anti-PD-1, now you can get good CD8 effector function. Why do I draw all this since I didn't show you data about many of these steps? Because in about six months ago, Bob Schreiber published in Nature a study in which he had isogenic tumor clones, one of which <clears throat> had both a class one and a class two neoantigen, and the other shared only the same class one neoantigen. He put those tumors on the two sides of the animals and either vaccinated them or gave them immunotherapy, and he only saw rejection of the tumor that had both the class one and the class two neoantigen, but that rejection was mediated by class one directed CD8 T cells. If the animal had a good population of CD8 T cells that were able to operate independently, both tumors should have been rejected. The fact that you only get rejection in cysts in the local tumor that also can present a class II neoantigen suggests that the kind of model I just showed you that came from the imaging data, in which there are these very localized regions in which CD4s are talking to the CD8s, not <clears throat> in the lymph node environment now, but actually in the tumor may be important and critical for the efficacy of checkpoint therapy. And this is something we and other <clears throat> groups are studying. 
That original method only looked at, say, 10 or 12 or even 14 parameters, yet we know there are many, many immune cells, lots of epithelial stroma cells, structural elements, and tumor antigens that need to be looked at. And so Andrea and Evelyn have devised a new multiplex staining platform called IBEX. It's a completely open system. It's not a commercial system. We've developed ways for doing the staining in a very few minutes uh, with great evenness in the sections. We then image, we then bleach the fluorochromes, and we validated that our bleaching method works very uniformly with a certain set of fluorochromes, no matter what antibodies they're conjugated to. So you can create any of the panels that you would like, and then you restain and re-image and you keep iterating. We validated about 150 to 200 antibodies for a whole variety of mouse or human tissues, not just lymphoid tissues. And so here's an example of this method now used with 82 antibodies on a human lymph node. You're only seeing four colors here. And that raises a question. How do you analyze 82 parameter staining data? If you think about, um, Cytoff, for example, it's already very complicated to look at 40 parameter data by iterative binary gating in order to multiplex phenotype individual cell subsets. Now think about doing that at 50, 60, 70, 80 parameters with retained spatial information. And so to get around the problem of doing that manually, Nishant in the lab has used machine learning uh, and what he does is he compresses all of the channels that I've shown you into three and colors them red, green, and blue and scales the color intensity to the pixel density. This is all pixel-based, not segmented images. And that enables us to look at dim versus medium versus bright cells in the way an immunologist would like to do that. And this is a reversible algorithm. So anything that's identified as a cluster and colored this way can be deconvolved into the marker set that gave rise to the images I'm going to show you. So here's an example, that 82 parameter lymph node, now analyzed by what we call the rapid method. And now these colors are not the individual colors of a fluorochrome in the way you normally look at fluorescence data. They represent uh, cells that have particular cl uh, clusters of markers and each cell with that shared marker is colored the same way. And so, for example, the algorithm picks out cells that share these four markers, CD1C, CD20, HLA-DR, and IgD, which defines a naive B cell. And these are all uh, colored the same way, and they're localized outside of the germinal center that we focused in on here. It picks out these cells with a combination of six markers, some positive, some negative, as germinal center B cells, and these all appear within the germinal center. You see that there's an accumulation of these Chi-67 dividing germinal center B cells in the dark zone here, and an accumulation of PD-1 high uh, multiplex marked TFHs in the light zone, and so on. In data that I'm not going to show you, we can then take these data and use them directly for computing spatial relationships among all the different cell types and cluster sets that are identified by these algorithms. Now, one of the problems is that even this multiplex undersamples tissue space because we're taking thin sections. And so a few years ago, we developed a new way of doing cleared uh, tissue. Are there are many methods for doing this but most or all of the other ones make it very difficult to do multiplex staining. It's good for looking at genetically labeled proteins or staining in one or maybe two colors by amplification. Here, we wanted to be able to do multiplex. And so here's a mouse lymph node uh, in five colors, stained intact, no sectioning. So this is the equivalent of say a millimeter cube uh, biopsy sample. And what you see in the fatter vessels are the beautiful branching arborization of the HEVs. Here are the peripheral B cell follicles. But when you go into the section mode, you realize that if you just looked at a section and at this cross section of an HEV, you'd never understand that three dimensional distribution and arborization. So there's clearly information in 3D that you don't get 
looking at 2D, but of course we can look um, computationally in the way we do histocytometry throughout the volume here and in principle with enough colors identify all the millions of cells in the lymph node in 3D. And so we've now used a combination of these tools to study regulatory T cells. And this is work by a spectacular fellow in the lab, Harry Wong, with a whole uh, slew of collaborators. We had published a number of years ago <clears throat> that uh, Tregs do not work by preventing autoreactive cells from becoming activated. We could see IL-2 production in conventional cells that were then surrounded by PSTAD5 positive Tregs, although this IL-2 producing conventional cell itself did not become PSTAD5 positive. And we showed in these studies with Sasha Radensky that these local regions seem to be important for mediating control of autoreactive cells, but we didn't understand mechanistically what was happening. And so that's what Harry has been working on. We didn't want to stick with looking at IL-2. That is doable, but very difficult in a very narrow time frame. And so we turned to PD-1. And it turns out that you can find in a steady state uh, in SPF animals, and I'll mention germ-free in a minute, PD-1 positive CD4s that are um, FOXP3 negative, and you see them in the multi uh, side view here. The distribution, positioning, and number of these cells is essentially identical in germ free mice, including the skin draining uh, lymph nodes that would have no exposure to food antigens. So we define these uh, as autoreactive T cells. And in accord with our nature paper, these PD-1 positive CD4 T cells are PSTAT5 negative. We then can do spatial statistics here by picking a PD-1 positive conventional CD4 as the frame of reference, and then measuring either in 2D or in 3D in shells, as opposed to these just regions of interest, the density of any other cell type that we pick out with our multiplex staining. And when we do that, and then we correct for the number of cells using a Monte Carlo simulation that um, randomizes the position of cells beyond the actual positioning in the image. What we see is that only the PD-1 positive cells are surrounded by a high local density of regulatory T cells within about five, 10 to 15 microns. We can use our multiplex staining to characterize those T regs as you would do with complex flow. So this is the kind of histocytometry effect. And when we do that, we see that there are two large groupings, cluster one and two, that don't have high levels of many of these markers, and clusters three and four that do, including the PSTAT5 marker. And when we again do the spatial statistics, it's these activated, uh, and I'll also call them in a minute, effector Tregs that are tightly clustered with the PD-1 positive autoreactive cells, whereas the, the more naive Tregs, if you wish to call them, are more randomly distributed. And so, as I said, these locally enriched Tregs are PSTAT5 positive, CHI-67 positive, CD25, very bright, CTLA-4 high, and FOXB3 high, identifying them as highly suppressive effector Tregs. If we block IL-2, we lose that phenotype and that tells us that the Tregs are not proactively preventing the activation of uh, autoreactive cells. And I already showed you that wasn't true because they already are making IL-2, but rather they're operating in a negative feedback mode in response to the activation and IL-2 production by the conventional cells. If we, and this just shows that the microdomains themselves are sensitive to the sensing of IL-2 by the Tregs. And that's because the IL-2 is driving the proliferation locally of those regulatory cells. We see that the nearby Tregs are very enriched in CHI-67. We've done confetti tracking to look at clonality and we see these clonal expansions of the Tregs in the vicinity of the PD-1 positive conventional cells. And so the Tregs are operating in a negative feedback mode to suppress the or respond to the conventional cells, but there's also feed forward amplification of highly suppressive Treg function, which then reinforces the control 
of the conventional cells. All this still doesn't tell us how the Tregs prevent autoimmunity. So to get at that, just as we had to do in the DTH model experiments, we need to have a way of knowing exactly when the processes are occurring in a temporal sense. And so to deal with that, we transfer very small numbers of an autoreactive TCR transgenic clone into intact animals, which in the where the Tregs are present, no autoimmunity develops. And we did this at a number where we only wound up with 5, 10, 15 or so uh, antigen-specific T cells in the gastric lymph node. That is, we are at physiological densities of cells. So both the studies I've shown you for the polyclonal system and here, uh, we're working at physiological levels, not the higher levels we typically use, for example, in 2P models. And the way we're able to do this now is to use our clarified lymph node. So this is a complete gastric lymph node. In red are the Tregs. These very small numbers of purple and green cells represent the co-transferred TXA autoreactive cells and a small number of poly uh, polyclonal naive cells to give us uh, an internal control. And we can completely quantify all of these cells and get accurate numbers at the level of 10 or 15 cells in the entire lymph node. <clears throat> and that turned out to give us a very surprising result. Not only do these autoreactive cells get activated in the presence of Tregs, they proliferate. And they expand 30-fold over three days, but then over the next week, they essentially all die off. So there's a continuous process of activation and expansion of autoreactive cells in vivo in the steady state, followed by Treg-dependent pruning, as we call it in which these cells die. And we can put this together in a model. I'm not going to show you all the other data that go with all of this. The literature suggests that Tregs are selected, uh, I'm sorry, the conventional cells are selected at a somewhat lower uh, TCR avidity or affinity than the regulatory T cells. When each of them meets up with their antigen presenting cells and they look at self antigens, the weaker stimulation of conventional cells causes a low level of CD25 expression and a little bit of IL-2 production. The Tregs put up more 25 and they're able to steal the IL-2. And this has been mathematically examined as well as experimentally examined by a former fellow of mine, Gregor Alton Benet, and, and all of his data uh, agree with this process. That now gives this expansion locally that I told you about of effector Tregs that help reinforce the suppression of these conventional cells. Why do you get the expansion and pruning? And that turns out to be due to a misunderstanding of IL-2. IL-2 does not drive T cells to proliferate. T cells accumulate MYC and will go into division, as Phil Hodgkin showed, through TCR or TCR and CD28 co-stimulation. When those cells make the IL-2, they're typically expecting to sense that IL-2 as they're dividing. But in the presence of Tregs, that doesn't happen, and cell, T cells that divide and don't get the survival signals and upregulation of NA-apoptotic components via IL-2 then die, and that accounts for the pruning that we've seen. We've mathematically modeled this process and, and also carried out experiments quantitatively from predictions from those models. The models suggest that uh, only a two-fold change in CTLA-4 expression on the Tregs would allow escape from this type of control. And that turns out to be true. And it phenocopies what happens in CTLA-4 heads in humans. It also predicts that even a 40% decrease in Treg density uh, will allow escape. And we see that. And that's consistent with the lower frequency of Tregs in the nod. Uh, and those data put together give us a lot of important um, insight into understanding how genetic polymorphisms that tend to map to regulatory regions as EQTLs that are under twofold can predispose to autoimmunity. Let me end by saying that we are expanding on the technology I've shown you. Um, there's a lot of antigen epitope loss in very, very uh, harsh fixation conditions that need to be used when you're dealing with BSL-3 or BSL-4. Um, uh, organisms and tissues, including COVID, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, 
Uh, opal is a method that's in the literature. It's commercially available for amplified staining, but typically was restricted to seven parameters. We've shown that we can put this together in our IBEX iterative um, bleaching protocol, and now we can expand this to very large panels, which eliminate some of the autofluorescence with FFPE, uh, harshly fixed material, and enables um, <clears throat> better antigen recovery. And then we've also worked with BioLegend and their total seq antibodies that are used in site seq for single cell RNA seq work to show that we can use oligo probes instead of directly conjugated antibodies in this system as well. And that means you can directly match the antibodies you use for the earth single cell RNA work to what you're actually seeing in the tissues. This also gives us a leg in to how we could do iterative staining in our 3D cleared tissues. And we have made some progress now getting up to 12 to 15 colors and we're continuing to work on that approach. We're combining this with spatial transcriptomics. So here's a 3D image where we've also done the staining for epithelial cells and lymphatics, as well as using an RNA scope probe uh, for RNA. And so this is not perfected yet, but we're getting close to being able to combine these two methods. We're also trying to work with uh, a form of spatial transcriptomics that has two micron on center resolution, so subcellular resolution, where we actually run the very fast version of the IBEX method that we can use now for a few cycles without degrading the RNA, so we can get a direct match between tissue imaging and the subsequent RNA work. We've worked how to do um, 16S RNA fish, so we can look at bacteria. And then we've used the expansion microscopy from Ed Boyden to improve resolution here. And this may be particularly important in tumors because it may enable us to actually see whether you get CD107A expression on the membrane to say that a particular T cell is undergoing degranulation. Finally, we're trying to combine the methods I talked about today. So live cell imaging, we then fix the system in place identify each of the cells, label them, then go into 3D multiplex imaging and registration, then play the movie backwards, and we can then relate the historical dynamic behavior of a cell to its dense phenotype at the end of time. And so we hope that I've convinced you that these are important ways of understanding the immune system, whether it's dynamic imaging, histocytometry, the multiplex version called IBEX, the uh, analytical tool rapid that I mentioned to you, the C3D imaging, and now the combination with FISH. Thanks very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Germain. This was fantastic. So now the session is open for questions, but uh, you know, uh, usually we do have quite a bit of them. Uh, now, I think that you, Professor Germain, really answered so many of them as you were talking that we don't have that many. Uh, I, though, I though have a couple of them, so to let people maybe think and write them down in the, in the chat while you answer to this warm up once. Um, I, going back to, to your story uh, about cloaking, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, I mean, I have a, you know, a very, very naive uh, technical question and a less so. Uh, the, the naive one is why the preparation of the peritoneum for multiphoto microscopy is specifically needed to properly see cloaking. And the more scientific question is, I was wondering what happens if cells other than fibroblasts are killed. For instance, if you kill a resident macrophage, not only the, the cell is much bigger per se, but you're also at the same time depriving the tissue from some cloaking function. So have you tried killing a macrophage? Do the other macrophages actually manage to cloak or, or not? Uh, let me ask the, the first question. It's not necessary to do this in a peritoneum. We've done this in skeletal muscle. Um, I showed you the data just from spontaneous loss of function and death in cells in the, in the diaphragm. So this occurs in multiple tissue sites. It's not unique. It's just the peritoneum was a particularly 
favorable place to do optical imaging on, under these conditions. But this is more, much more general. This pattern of resident macrophages exists in virtually all serosal and pleural surfaces, but also deeper in tissues, for example, you know, for, the, for the muscles. We've shown in a dystrophic model in which we know it's a neutrophil dependent process that if you, from birth, deplete the resident macrophages, you accelerate that disease and the damage to the muscles by several weeks. So we've done that in multiple systems. As far as killing other cells and what happens with the cloaking, we did that in a little different way. If we kill a cell at, say, 9 o'clock on a, on a clock face, yep. allow 20 minutes for the cloaking to take place, and we now kill a cell at three o'clock on the clock face. The cell, the macrophages in between have turned their attention to the nine o'clock position and they're unable to turn around and get back to the damage at three o'clock and we get neutrophil swarming and damage in that region. So they only can, uh, can look at a certain amount of damage and it doesn't really matter whether it's fibroblast. I, I know I, I pointed out to be a fibroblast, but it can be a macrophage or, or a skeletal muscle cell or anything else. It doesn't really change what happens. So this is clearly a mechanism that is not geared to deal with large scale tissue damage. It only deals with um, this episodic damage to individual cells. Okay, and I believe we have a question from Mike. Oh, Ron, I just want to say that was a technical tour de force. Of course, I'm a fan of in vivo imaging approaches, and you've greatly expanded the number of parameters that can be examined, and I'm looking forward to a lot more uh, from combining histocytometry with imaging. I think that last slide or two that you had was re really tantalizing. As far as mechanisms are concerned, you know, I'm unapologetically a fan of calcium signaling, and uh, I would like to know whether you think how do, you, how do you think it works that these neutrophils are chemotaxing toward a particular cell after damage? And how are the macrophages operating to interact with that process? Do you think it's P2 receptors? We, we've actually done blocking. If you block individual P2X or P2Y receptors, you don't see a phenotype. But if you drug block um, the combination, then you don't get the first um, sensing of the damage. And apres will also kill that. And that's consistent with earlier data from Mike Dustin in, in the brain in terms of microglial acute responses to laser damage. Yeah. yeah. Um, although there they said an individual receptor work here, an individual receptor in, in knockout mode does not prevent the response. The second phase after that sensing is uh, due to rage. So if you block rage, then you don't get the extension and the cloaking part. But as I said earlier about worrying about what's in the black, those are things we know are necessary. We don't say they're sufficient. And so we've actually done calcium imaging uh, under these conditions. And there are all sorts of different calcium signals. They're from the dying cells. They're from the macrophages. They involve the fibroblasts. They blink. They do lots of interesting things that we haven't worked out. And it's something that uh, Stefan is, I think, going to continue at some level. So there's lots of calcium signal going on under these conditions, but I can't say that I can tell you exactly what it means or which we haven't done that where we then sort of systematically walk through what is causing that signal. So okay, what about the macrophages? What are those cells doing? In terms of signaling? What are the macrophages doing yeah, to allow them under some circumstances to dampen the response, but not others? It really has to do, at least at the limit of resolution we can achieve in our imaging, with physically preventing the, new, the lead neutrophils from touching the damage, the, the corpse. If they don't touch, this is something that Tim Lammerman had shown, the, the, a few of the early arriving neutrophils die very quickly as soon as they touch the damage. And that gives you a burst of LTB4. And LTB4 then works in a signal relay mode, even with living neutrophils, to give you this expansion of the, the dimensionality over which the cells are recruited. And so the cloaking actually physically keeps any neutrophils that sense that there's something going on in the tissue from doing that. And then you don't get this um, amplification into the swarming. And without the swarming, you don't get the damage. 
And so that's, that's actually what the macrophages are doing. That's why I said, if you distract them and they can't, you don't, you don't have enough of them to put enough processes out to completely surround the next lesion you make, you still get a swarm there. And if we scale the lesion up to multiple cells, then the number of macrophages and their cellular processes in a given region is too small to completely cloak that larger damage. Then you get the swarm, you get secondary damage, you get recruitment of the monocytes to become macrophages. And then in a Coombs kind of manner, they start as pro-inflammatory M1-like, and then they go to M2 and you get wound healing, but often with a scar. Whereas what I'm describing, you don't get that secondary phase, you don't get scars, you just get a division of say the damage the, the neighboring fibroblast that fills in the gap and you're back to normal tissue physiology. Okay, second, second part of the question, if, you, if people don't mind, um, again, related to calcium. I was really intrigued by your uh, approaches to studying Treg suppression of um, other cells and wanted to know if you thought that our results on calcium signaling in which Tregs can prevent the calcium signals of effector T cells could be somehow involved in your modeling effort to understand the dynamics in a more um, three-dimensional sense. So in the, in the naive setting, the steady state level of Tregs clearly can't be preventing calcium or you wouldn't get IL-2 out of the conventional cells since NFAT is a necessary component of that signal but we haven't done the calcium signaling to, to show that explicitly. So I don't think that's what they're doing in the steady state. And a lot of what I described is that they operate in a feedback mode, but the data you showed me and, and the systems you have in, a, in the effector mode in a tissue, I'm not sure follow exactly all the same rules that I just showed in the naive um, state and then the lymph node. So I think it's gonna be interesting to compare uh, and, and see exactly what's going on. There may be some limitation in the extent of TCR signaling, and you might see that as a diminution in either the amplitude or the duration of the calcium signal rather than an elimination of it that then tempers the overall response. So we need to have you know, very fine-grained measurements to begin to look yeah. at. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to give a little shout out to Shiva Othi and Amit Jairaman, who are both in the audience. So they're the ones who actually did the work that I showed you earlier today. And um, thanks to them, we have a little bit more information about Treg suppression of the calcium signal in TH17 cells. Okay, there are some things in the chat. Yes. Uh, LCMV and destruction of lymphoid architecture. Um, actually, um, Scott Muller, who was the one who characterized some of that when he was with Rafi, was in the lab for a while learning the 2P methods. And what he showed is that the destruction of the FRC network leads to um, migration arrest of T cells in the lymph node. And that probably partially accounts for the so-called immunosuppression that occurs in the LCMV uh, system. So yes, that is a problem. And that motility returns as the FRC network is reestablished. That's as much as I know about that. Um, yeah, so in terms of brain and microglia, if you actually look at Ito Amit's paper on the microglia, the pictures they show look just like the cloaking uh, images that I showed you. And we've done a limited amount of brain imaging. And yes, we see in a, an Alzheimer's uh, animal model, um, what look like cloaking patterns from the microglia. Uh, what we don't know, and we haven't had time under the current circumstances to pursue these studies, is whether those uh, microglial cells early on are acting in an anti-inflammatory manner, but the persistent uh, problem with the, the local amyloid leads them to become more inflammatory and um, approach the state people have reported where the microglial cells are now not protective so much, but actually damaging. So there could be a change in the behavior from this acute system I'm showing you today to a more chronic system where the behavior is actually different. So yes, this, this does operate in many different tissues uh, in, the, in the baseline sort of steady state for acute damage or cell death. Uh, it seems to operate in the way I've described, but 
if you get frustrated phagocytosis with um, you know insoluble depositions like amyloid, you may get a different outcome. That is awesome, Professor Germain. Thank you so much for the incredible talk, for uh, and for your insights on all our questions and for having interacted with us today. In regard to that, your your last you know uh, um, how can I say task is a meeting with the students which